Hey, Rahul. Hey. Morning. Hi, Dr. Vandita. How are you? Hey. Hang on. Cool. All right, everyone. Okay, let's go. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it is a sincere privilege to have uh, Dr. Alan Job speak to us. He is truly the bridge between us neonatologists, the clever basic scientists, and the obstetricians. Um, Alan, before we start, a message uh, from one of your old students, Book Cho from Malaysia. He's very sorry to miss this and hopes that he can get the recording because without you, he would never be comfortable delivering twin lambs with his bare hands. <laughs> so that's a skill he that- probably, he, he probably should have worn gloves. <laughs> uh, bare hands, he said, bare hands. <laughs> anyway, um, so we might get a move on. People will be joining and if it's okay, we will start recording your talk and uh, upload it with your permission, but we can talk to you afterwards about that, if there's anything controversial there. Um, okay, so the- Hopefully, hopefully everything I say is controversial. I hope so. Yeah, it'll be fun. All right. Particularly for the obstetricians. <laughs> okay, over to you, Ellen. So if we're gonna make better babies, we have to understand why the babies have deficits. There's differences in drugs and effects on the newborn. I wanna talk a little bit about that. I wanna talk about how the developmental origins of health and disease concept may be unavoidable because of bad effects that influence our babies and that we can't fix unless we understand why they're caused without, our, without new therapies. Uh, and then I wanna make suggestions about dosing antenatal steroids. Next slide. Actually, you changing the slides is good. It paces me a little bit. So this is just a sketch of mine. Um, so the normal curve there is for normal, uh, normal term population where the mean IQ is 100. And of course, you hope your kids have a higher IQ than that. Um, and then that second curve is for very low birth weight infants. And so there are three areas on that curve that I think are a problem that we don't always think about. One is the peak. The second is this large shoulder on the side of it. And the third is the little hump at the bottom where you have the babies that are really damaged. And uh, so to make all these babies normal, we have to attack, attach the three parts of the curve. Next slide. So this, these are data, this is a, 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 a meta regression analysis of standardized mean differences in IQ for extremely low and very low birth weight infants between 1990 and 2010. So each, each circle is a different study and the size of the circle is the size of the population. And what you see is the regression line hits the uh, standard mean difference at a point about minus seven, which means that these kids have a, an IQ deficit of about 10 to 15 points on the average. So our pre preterm babies are not normal as a population. And I think that's something we all have to, to deal with at some level. Next slide. For those of you interested in BPD, these are the same data from the same study, looking at the intercept for babies who have BPD versus percent of BPD in the population of the nursery they come from. So uh, basically it's the same story, except if you have a really high incidence of BPD, you're gonna have a lot of damaged babies in terms of IQ. Next slide. These are studies from Canada looking at um, records of uh, use of audiometry testing and suspected neurocognitive disorders on, on large populations of kids who either got antenatal steroids as preterms and then delivered at term or um, delivered at term. So the, blue, the greens are the normal population for just the use of these services in Canada, which has a national healthcare system so they can get these data. We can't do that in the US because we have a really shitty uh, healthcare system. The, end of the, 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 end, the point of this is, is that the kids who were born at term after receiving antenatal steroids as preterms are using more research, resources relative to neurocognitive disorders. I'm gonna talk a lot more about this later. Next slide. So this, I'm gonna talk about two, slide, two uh, studies from 
Finland now. These are population-based studies over a long number of years of hundreds of thousands of babies. So there's preterms here, there's near terms, and there's terms. And this is again about antenatal steroid exposure, which I'll finish off with a lot of at the end of this talk. And so these are deficits in birth weight and in head circumference relative to the preterm. So steroids make your preterm head smaller and they make your near-term baby's head smaller and they make your um, term baby's head smaller and they're born with lighter birth weights. So um, these are again, population studies from Finland. On the next slide is the really problematic thing. Next slide. These are studies again from Finland from 670,000 births. It's tracking neurodevelopmental outcome from the whole population of Finland from 2006 to 2017. And there are three bars here. One's for the entire cohort of term deliveries. And the next bar is term deliveries exposed to antenatal steroids as preterm infants, presumably for some cause. And the third bar is uh, preterm infants. So it's, two things are really interesting. First of all, the preterms. You'd expect the preterms to have uh, problems uh, in terms of neurodevelopment. But the, pro the thing is, is apparently the use of preterm of steroids in the preterm population actually cancels its potential adverse neurodevelopmental effects. So that's a good result. The problem is, is that second bar where the term deliveries that were exposed to antenatal steroids as preterms are actually worse than the overall population. So this is only 160,000 births. So over um, 15 years. So, uh, I mean, I think this is a, a message to us that giving women that don't need steroids, steroids is probably a really bad idea. Next slide. So let's talk about the lung a little bit. This is a slide I made a number of years ago when the thought was that severe BP BPD attenuated your alveolarization across early life uh, to that of a normal, the upper bar being the normal lung and the lower one being the severe BPD. We actually have more data now that it's probably not predominantly air, alveolar number, but it's got more to do with airway function in terms of FBV1. Let's go to the next slide. A lot of these, these data are actually from uh, Australia. These aren't from Australia. The concept here is that lung function of an infant being preterm or term tracks across the lifespan. So there's some of these kids who are measured at a very young age and they have super lungs, if you like. They're probably the Steve Admins of the world who ran marathons and stuff like that. Um, and then there's a, these other kids that track at different curves. And then we have that unfortunate group down there that track uh, with a low uh, lung volume throughout the lifespan. These studies have been now extended out to 36 years. Next slide. There's slides of, there's measurements from Australia from uh, Lex Doyle out to about 28 years. Let's go back one slide, there we go. So these are measurements that, are, that were just published by Hearst in a, in a really nice paper of uh, the, the Marlowe cohort who are now 26 years of age. These were born at less than 26 weeks in the UK uh, and Ireland in 1995. And their blood pressures, when you measure them, um, uh, are pretty normal. The problem is, is they do a thing called an augmentation index, which apparently adjusts for central blood pressure. And in that case, the um, extremely preterms have eleva elevated central blood pressure. There's other data that says that their aortas, aortas are less elastic. And there's uh, MRI data saying that heart development through fetal life of the preterm is really uh, abnormal and it stays abnormal through their nursery uh, 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 stay. And I'm not gonna show you that data, I just don't have time. Next slide. This is stuff that I, I find really fascinating. It's on telomere length. So it turns out that the boys, of course, take it in the shorts like they usually do relative to the girls. The preterm boys at 18 to 27 years have shorter telomeres. 
than uh, their mothers. So they're not, it's not caused by something from the mother to the baby. So what that means is that they're older, that, uh, you know, um, metabolically. And then there's the stuff on the metabolic syndrome. If you put it all together between, between the neurodevelopmental problems, the, the lung problems and the heart problems, and the Teeler uh, uh, problems, then our preterm infants when they leave the nursery at close to term are actually aged considerably. And that has probably a lot of implications for other diseases such as diabetes and heart disease. Next slide. We have no idea how to deal with that. So this is something that we can deal with. This is a slide that many of you have seen from Barbara Schmidt. Um, uh, her studies, many of them in Australia, looking at the summation effects of various injuries on these babies in terms of their 18 month outcome. If you just have BPD, you have a 40% having a, of having a bad uh, outcome. If you have brain injury, which really means IVH, you have a much higher rate. And if you have all three with severe ROP, you're basically stuffed. Um, so that's the bump on the bottom of the curve that I showed you is the second slide. So the message from this is, is avoiding injury is clearly a priority in our babies. We don't really know how to prevent ROP and we don't know how to prevent uh, brain injury. And unfortunately, we don't really know how to prevent BPD either, but those should be targets for future studies. Next slide. So how to make babies better, avoid injury, learn that there are no obvious that are some of the Doha effects are not obvious and avoid them. The problem is we don't know what causes them, so we can't really avoid them. But that's an area that deserves a lot of research to figure out what that's all about. Avoid prematurity, that's easy to say. Give antenatal steroids only to pregnancies that will benefit. Next slide. So summary of outcomes. Uh, the preterm plus or minus antenatal steroids may cause early aging of the preterm heart and lungs. The Dohaid concepts uh, include the metabolic syndrome, which may be a substantial risk for preterm populations. We have no clue how to avoid other than to avoid prematurity. Minimize antenatal exposure to pregnancies that will not benefit. I'll talk about that more at the end. Next slide. So this is the big overview. You've all seen a hundred of these slides. Everybody makes them and they're all a little different. I think the one I want to comment on that is really uh, probably important is that there's good data that preconceptual smoking, fetal exposure to smoking, and postnatal ex exposure to smoking is the most consistent um, exposure that causes lung abnormalities in our preterm infants. And the problem is that's not so easy to solve either. Uh, next slide. So this is, this is a take home message for the clinicians. So we have respiratory outcomes and heart outcomes and metabolic syndrome outcomes. And what we have is if we're thinking about steroids, we have fetal exposures. Many of our preterm infants get very early um, steroids for blood pressure. And then we give them postnatally for lung injury. And then as the kid finally gets out of the unit and goes to his pediatrician or his follow-up, He's all, they're getting put on steroids then as well for their airway reactivity. So the point is, is when you think about steroid use, you really have a series of um, exponential equations that we don't think about in terms of the potential impacts on the fetus. Next slide. Each exposure, of course, is time dependent and dose dependent. So there's different drugs, and I want to talk a little bit about this. There's uh, for antenatal steroids, the, what's used in Australia and New Zealand almost exclusively is a drug called Celestone. I know I'm supposed, not supposed to mention a drug, but it's really, what, it's, what it is, and probably a lot of you don't know this, it's a, it's a cloudy suspension that has 12 milligrams of beta-methazone phosphate as a soluble drug and 12 milligrams of beta-acetate, which is in a, a in particulate matter, which forms a depot that is released slowly. Then postnatally, for whatever reason, we use dex and hydrocortisone. Next slide. 
So what about the adrenals of our poor little babies? Well, first of all, fetal cortisol levels are really low uh, before 30 weeks, where cortisol synthesis is only significant at about 30 weeks. Uh, preterms are generally adrenal deficient at birth. Uh, they may do better when treated with low dose hydrocortisone. This is a, a recent nice review by Bod and Christy Waterberg. Uh, next slide. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this antenatal steroids. That's the stuff I've been working on for a number of years now. So the problem with this is the, comple the complex pharmacology, which I th don't think we think about a lot. We're using a drug to treat the mother to treat the fetus. So the variables are dose and root, placental transfer, clearance from the pregnant mother to the fetus, clearance in the fetus. And I'll talk about that just a little bit. A little, uh, uh, exposure is another issue. I have one slide on that a little better, uh, different. We don't know what the appropriate exposure is to prevent, prevent RDS, IVH, and death. And it might be that they're entirely different. Let's go to the next slide. So this is that slide. This is a reanalysis of the, the now famous Roberts and Dalzell uh, 19, uh, 2006 meta-analysis that I think is the one most of us use. Um, this, they redid it looking at the interval between the time of treatment of the mother and the time of delivery for efficacy. And it turns out for neonatal deaths, that efficacy is all uh, at less than 48 hours. So you give it early if you wanna prevent death. If you wanna prevent RDS, the interval is 48 hours to one day. And it, the problem is for IVH, it's only between 48 hours and one day. Now, the problem with these data is that most of those studies never reported this data because um, it wasn't thought to be important at the time. People were only looking at RDS outcomes. So uh, I think it's soft, but I think it makes the point that when, we, when we're telling the parents what we're gonna do to fix their baby before they're born, that we have to be a little careful about this interval uh, of time issue in terms of so I think the obstetricians have it right. If they give antenatal steroids for two days for preeclampsia and then deliver, that captures most of these outcomes. Next slide. I hate to say the obstetricians are right, that hurts me. Any rate, I can't hear your laughing because this is just a one way sound. So I wanna show you some real data now that hopefully will make you think twice about what we're doing. So again, the, the this, Drug we're using in women is 12 milligrams, that's six milligrams of beta-methasone phosphate and six milligrams of beta-methasone acetate. And we actually give it twice, once at 24 hours, once at recognition of preterm delivery, and then once at 24 hours. These are cord blood levels are not really published, but they're, they're extracted from a clinical study that reported on uh, blood levels and uh, in, in twins and uh, obese women. But these are the primary data that have never been published and I've been trying to get a permission to republish them. So these are the maternal blood levels at 6.5 days. The maternal, the cord blood level is between one and five nanograms per milliliter and about, you know, six or eight babies there. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that level as that, if that's important or not. The next slide shows the maternal levels, which are basically the same. So what I want you to look at, can we go back one slide? So what I'd like you to look at, I don't know if my arrow works or not, is these points here. These are babies that obviously arrived in the emergency room, got the mother got her celestone, went up to the delivery suite and delivered, probably in four hours or six hours. And these babies have blood levels approaching 50 nanograms per milliliter. That's higher than the level that it would be in a COVID patient getting DEX. So that's really a high level. And so the, the level that the fetus has in him at the time of delivery is a function of the time between the, la the second dose or the first dose and the time of delivery. So let's go to the next slide. These are the maternal values, and these are values measured at 6.5 days. Again, in uh, the maternal blood, 
of these babies who delivered. So these are paired samples. And again, it's measurable and it's substantial actually. Let's go to the next slide. This is the ratio. And if you read the literature, the ratio is supposed to be about 0.4, but clear between the fetus and the mother, but clearly it's all over the place. And by, uh, by 6.5 days, the average is about one, probably because these values have come to equilibrium after that period of time. Next slide. So these are newer data that were just published not long ago. Um, um, that are from France, from a study where they're using Celestone as a single dose. This study is finished and apparently is being analyzed, but I don't know the results. And you know, that's a strategy that obstetricians could use is give only one dose. And I've circled the area out at three to four days. And the blood levels in the, the upper curve is maternal and the lower curve is cord blood levels. And again, the levels in the fetus and the mother are about four nanograms per milliliter. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So these are, these are studies we did in Australia, compliments of the Gates Foundation. We were trying to understand the pharmacop... It's, it's actually pretty amazing that these are very common drugs, but there isn't good pharmacokinetics on these drugs because they're so old that nobody ever did the studies. So we got the money to actually study the dosing, the drugs that we're using for antenatal steroids because they wanted to do a trial in low resource environments. So what we're, what we're measuring here, we're giving women six milligrams of dex phosphate or beta phosphate or celestone, where the mixture is three milligrams of the acetate and three milligrams of the phosphate or dex phosphate and beta phosphate orally. And what you see is there's clearly a difference in clearance between the, the dex and the beta. The, the, the beta is much, has a much slower clearance. It's about the clearance rate is about half that. The peak values per dose are almost identical. The other thing that's interesting is that oral versus IM are uh, absorption and clearance are essentially identical. So your women who don't wanna get a shot, you know, you could give them oral drug, it's probably just as good. But the important thing about this slide is out there where the red circle is. Uh, these are blood levels that we measured it. We, we actually gave, gave these women two doses and then we brought them, we did this study, the first study, then we sent them home for a week and then we brought them back and did a second study um, because then we could control for the, the, the women and their perhaps biological variability. And what you see is that uh, these women, you know, 11 days after they'd had their initial dose, still had measurable plasma levels in their circulation. And that was about 1.36 nanograms per milliliter. Now, of course, the women, the clinical dose is four times that because uh, the, the women get 12 milligrams of beta-methasone acetate. So their level would be about four nanograms per milliliter <clears throat> at two weeks. And you can see that over the next week, next 96 hours we sampled them, there was no decay in their blood level. I think that's really remarkable. And I think that's something we have to think about when we're thinking about the concept of retreating women, because our women in the US are mostly getting the same drug, Celestone. <clears throat> so it sort of makes no sense to retreat a woman at seven days if she already has a, a, a therapeutic blood level from her first round of treatment. So I think that's something we need to think about. And the other part of it is that our babies have beta-methasone in their circulation out to uh, you know, two weeks after their initial dose. Let's go to the next slide. I bet nobody ever thought about that. So let's look at the adrenal effects of this drug. These are all these five doses of drugs given to these 48 women. So the first part of the curve there is the um, the um, just the standard uh, circadian rhythm of cortisol. So if it's late in the afternoon for you folks, I understand why you're falling asleep. Look at the value at about four in the afternoon, it's really low. 
um, that's when that's when you need to get a hit of your boost or whatever you take. Um, by the next morning, it's 77. And then when we hit them with the, these doses of drugs, which are relatively small doses, what happens is their cortisol just plummets. And with the celestone, the green curve, it's still suppressed at 96 hours. So again, giving a second dose to these, a second go round of these women at a week of age, uh, probably just suppresses their adrenal for the whole time before their preterm delivery. Let's go to the next slide. Let's skip this slide. So I wanna show you some sheep and monkey data to show you that the beta acetate actually works. So the, the, the blue, the blue uh, bars are sheep, pregnant sheep treated with, uh, with the, the clinical drug, either two doses or one dose. The green ones are treated with only the beta-methazone acetate, getting rid of the beta-methazone phosphate. And what you see is five milligrams, uh, 0.5 milligrams is a big dose, 0.25 or 0.125, which is a low dose. Um, the pressure volume curve on the on my right is for uh, the 0.125 of, of beta acetate, and it's equivalent to compliance from the same dose um, in these animals. So the low dose is as effective as, as one quarter of the dose of steroids relative to the clinical dose. Let's go to the next slide. So in the rhesus macaque, this is a bit of a summary slide. I'll show you the data in just a moment. One dose of the same dose, 1.25 milligrams per kilogram, is comparable to one or two doses of the clinical dose that we're treating women with. Maternal and fetal blood levels for lung responses are very low, possibly even lower in pregnancy. A dose of 0.06 milligrams of beta, beta phosphate or beta acetate showed less lung maturation in the macaque, so that's probably too low. Therefore, lung maturation does not require a high peak beta level, but the fetal levels are low and maintained for 24 hours with one dose of beta acetate. Next slide. These are monkey values done at UC Davis um, uh, in uh, pregnant macaques. The black curve is for non-pregnant animals with looking at beta acetate. So the levels when you use beta acetate in the non-pregnant mon monkey don't get very high. They only get up to about six. If you use beta phosphate or dex phosphate, the level would be about 100. If you use um, beta acetate uh, in the mother, the pregnant mother, that's the green curve. The curves are even lower for some reason. We don't understand that. Um, and the green curves are actually blood levels in the fetus sampled by amniocentesis, cortocentesis in these fetal monkeys. So this is pretty unique data. And you can see the blood level in the fetus is about one nanogram per milliliter. Uh, and it persists at that level out to 24 hours. This is submitted data by Gus Schmidt. It's been reviewed favorably and revised. So presumably it's about in print. Next. Okay, so this is, th these are pressure volume curves for the month. I can't click, I don't have a click. There we go, thank you. So can you get it back to full screen? I guess that's as good as it's gonna be, that's good. Okay, next slide please. These are functional data in the monkey. So the pressure volume curves and the SATPC levels are shown there. The pressure volume curves for the beta acetate 0.125 and the clinical drug are the same. And the, the, the surfactant levels are qualitatively higher uh, with the, uh, the 0.125 of beta acetate. That's the one that causes only one nanogram per milliliter uh, steroid level in the, in the mother. And I showed you data that the mother and the fetus have levels approaching four nanograms per milliliter at uh, six days and probably at two weeks. Let's go to the next slide. 
This is a redraw. Uh, the blue curve is for our, our cortisogenesis values in monkeys, and the red is for sheep, given uh, the low dose of, of uh, beta acetate. So their levels, that, and they're responding at about three nanograms per milliliter. It's probably too high a dose. Next slide. So uh, just a statement I'm gonna make because I don't have time to show you all the data and it, much of it isn't actually published yet. And that is if you look at beta phosphate versus dex phosphate, the phosphorylated drugs in, in, in our human study from India, there's equivalent, uh, there's differences in PK, but there's not differences in PD in terms of bioequivalence in terms of effect on uh, white cells and uh, the adrenal axis. Uh, the blood levels are strictly proportionate to dose. A minimum dose assuming anti-inflammatory effects have some exposure required. We don't know what that actually is for lung maturation with beta phosphate given IM. I'll show you a little bit of data about that. Would be antenatal steroids with beta phosphate given IM at eight doses of 0.15 milligram uh, to give a total of 12 milligrams. So that would be one way to dose women at a lower dose. The problem is it requires multiple doses. But if you're talking about oral doses, that's one small pill, it's not a big deal. I did a calculation off of the, uh, the DART study uh, and estimate that uh, the newborn's level after DART, assuming they're like the monkeys, is about two nanograms per milliliter in your newborn after you treat with DART. So I said that the 0.06 milligrams is the wrong dose. So we probably could go down a little bit with DART as well. Let's go to the next slide. I don't know if Peter Davis is on or not. Let's skip this slide. Okay, the other thing as many of you know is my interest in the, the interactive effects of inflammation and antenatal steroids. So this is a study that's also part of Gus's study that's in press with a control group, an LPS group that overlaps completely with beta-methazone acetate. The upper curve, which shows better effects, is with LPS plus beta acetate. So there's an interaction, there's both in sheep and in monkeys, of inflammation with glucocorticoids. And when you look at the surfactin, the same phenomena seems to occur. So we know that it's not a contraindication to use steroids in women with choreo, unless it's florid choreo and they're just about to deliver, uh, because then the fetus would have a high steroid level, but maybe you want that, I don't know. But um, that probably gives them an extra boost. Next slide. Okay, how can we improve antenatal steroids? Well, something I think that probably most of you don't think about when you go in and consent a mother for making her baby, baby better with antenatal steroids, you probably don't do that, the obstetricians do, is that only about 40% of fetuses actually respond. So I think that's a real issue. Uh, the L LPS inflammation causes consistently more maturation in animal models. It's a, larger, it's a larger effect by itself often than antenatal steroids. So if we could learn what LPS is triggering, then maybe we could get a, a better kick from something to better mature our babies. We could better target our babies to only treat those that will benefit. I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, I consider repeat exposures as a, just a, a, an excuse to get adverse effects. And we can certainly use lower doses. Next slide. So why do only 40% of fetuses respond with lung maturation? Well, the simple explanation would be pharmacology. The dose exposure would be different for each fetus because of maternal blood level, placental transfer, fetal blood level, and then clearance in both the maternal and the fetal compartments. So you'd have different drug exposures. So therefore some fetus would respond and some wouldn't. It could be also a biological difference in maturation of steroid receptors or cells that are responding to steroids in the lung. That's a, certainly a possibility, but it's hard, a lot harder to prove. So I'm gonna show you an experiment to disprove that it's maternal or fetal blood, blood levels. This is a 
paper that uh, Matt Kemp has in press, the American Journal of OBGYN. We had we gave ten all all work done in Perth. We gave uh, ten uh, maternal fetal pair pairs saline placebo. We gave twenty maternal fetal pairs a clinical dose of beta acetate plus beta phosphate. Then we measured maternal and fetal blood levels, and then we uh, delivered these animals and measured lung function, and then looked at uh, the drug levels in the fetus. Next slide. So our assessment of a response is there in the B frame. It's a CO2 response. You can see that there's the controls, uh, the first curve, the first block, then the responders, and then the non-responders that receive steroids. And they're clearly separate. They separate in frame A by pH, by PCO2 and by PO2, heart rate and blood pressure. So um, some of these fetuses responded they didn't respond. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So this is the bottom line. These are the curves for the uh, responders and the non-responders. So the drug exposures of the, uh, the mother uh, and the fetus were identical. Uh, by any way, you, could, uh, uh, you can't do statistics on that and make a difference. So that means it's not a so giving your mother more steroid isn't going to fix the problem of the beta baby not responding. So um, that's not the answer. So the answer probably is in the biology of how lungs are matured with antenatal steroids. And that's something that we're going to try to get on, get, uh, get together with uh, single cell mRNA seq in monkey models. And Matt wants to try it in sheep. Next slide. This is sort of the bottom line thinking about steroids and low dose. This is, it turns out in terms of the biology of steroids, that free ster steroid is what signals, not what's in the plasma bound to protein. And so we have responders and non-responders. This is from this fetal sheep model. Uh, and in maternal and fetal. And look how low those levels are. They're just incredibly low. So that's how much steroid you need to tickle the fetal lung, presumably to get it to respond. So uh, next slide, please. So this is the final bit of this talk. And then we have some time for discussion if people want to ask questions. Many women uh, exposed to antenatal steroids do not benefit. The fetus, for those of us with gray hair, we remember that the fetus uh, is already mature for even very low gestational age fetuses. In those early uh, CPAP studies, many of the babies didn't get surfactant because they didn't have an indication. Most of our later term gestation babies from 34 weeks on don't benefit. So are there opportunities to identify uh, and treat only pregnancies that will benefit? Next slide. So this is work we're doing uh, with uh, Bina Kamath here at Cincinnati. We're doing mRNA sequencing on uh, amniotic fluid, looking for signals for different organs. So, you, so the red is signals characteristic of the organs. So the bladder sh clearly shows up, the skin sh clearly shows up, the lung clearly shows up, and the placenta clearly shows up. Those are the organs you'd anticipate would show up. Um, so the now, now the game is to figure out which of those mRNA signals is a good maturational marker that could be used on maternal blood to identify women that have a fetus at risk who might actually want to respond to antenatal steroids. We might even find a marker of steroid responsiveness. So that's work in progress. Next slide. So there, there are residual questions. Can we accurately it, can there be an accurate estimate of the lowest fetal plasma con concentration for benefit in the human? That study can be done, but it has to be done as part of a large randomized controlled trial where um, you get cord blood on every baby that delivers, and then you measure clinical outcome relative to cord blood levels. Now, it turns out that nobody's ever made that correlation. All the cord blood levels I showed you from the human had no clinical correlate. Um, 
So what is the efficacy and risk of antenatal steroids in low and middle income countries? I can give you a talk on that, another talk if you want. Um, the answer is we don't really know. There is a trial completed by the WHO, which is in press apparently. So we'll have to wait till that comes out. I don't know the results, uh, but I'm not, and I'm not supposed to tell you. So at any rate, uh, the bottom line is that study doesn't answer the question because it was done in the highest quality units in Africa and in India. So it doesn't test the question in low clinic environments. Can you actually improve outcomes where most of the kids are dying? Um, what we don't know is will lower doses decrease risks for you know, um, the Dohad sort of phenomena. The problem with that is, is all of us will be dead before we would ever know because those babies have to be 50 or 60 years old before we know the implications of that. How do we best identify only pregnancies that will identify, will benefit from annual steroids? And I think there's, there's a number of people who are working on that. So we need uh, a, a neonatal RCT in low and middle income countries in really low resource environments. So that's something that uh, I'm trying to persuade the Gates Foundation and WHO to do now using a low dose strategy. And we probably need a trial in high, in high uh, we probably need a trial in Australia or the US of low dose strategy, strategies for us before uh, people should accept this and treat women because we don't have any proof that it's gonna work. It works in monkeys, so it's probably gonna work in humans. Uh, I think that's my last slide. So thanks very much for this opportunity to uh, jog your thought process about what can, I think the technical message for the neonatologist is that your baby often will have steroid levels as a result of maternal treatment. And the other is to, to not con your mothers into thinking that steroids are gonna solve all their problems. They certainly won't. They may be causing as many as their, their, uh, their uh, curing. And the problem is, is that many of these effects are very delayed and they're not obvious. So um, we have no good handle on uh, figuring out how to uh, do studies to target those because we can't do studies with outcomes at 20 or 30 or 40 years. All we can do is be, the best we can do is be fins and do neurodevelopment on the whole population of babies that are born. That's not gonna happen in the US and I doubt that'll happen in Australia. But maybe um, the folks in Australia can convince their healthcare service to do something like that. So thanks very much. I guess I made it through despite my brain tumor and uh, the best to all of you. So my plans are to uh, make it, my first plan was when I recovered from my anesthesia uh, from the brain surgery was to say to myself, I have to live long enough to vote against Trump. Well, I've done that. So that's done. So now I have to survive long enough to go to Australia next July and be capable of doing that. So wish me the best. Thanks very much. And uh, I'm gonna to start toasting myself with some uh, red Shiraz from uh, South Australia. Okay, Thanks. that's amazing. Thank you so much, Alan, that's wonderful. We'll go snorkeling in Indonesia too. Lots of Indonesians on online. So you've got two people that you mentioned. Uh, they are online. There's uh, first Peter Davis. I see Peter there, and there's uh, Matt Kemp. Um, so do you want to ask um, grill them first, or do you want to go through the multiple um, questions that you have on the chat page? Uh, I, I'd what, love to talk to Peter. Peter, unmute yourself. We're, uh, we're laying out the red carpet as we speak, Alan. July uh, 2021 it is. Okay, hopefully. Can't, can't Maybe wait. I can stop by Melbourne. Who knows? Yeah, no, we'll keep that hat on. It's obviously working. Well, this thing is covering up these arrays on top of my head. I have, I have uh, uh, everything stuck on top of my head. And if you look at my skin, it's really ratty from having uh, tape on my head all over the top of my head for six months. It's a very cool look. Yeah, very cool look. I have to do something different for Australia. Okay, so what's your question, Peter? Well, Alan, I, I just um, 
maybe make the observation that Colin Morley would would agree with you. This basic philosophy that less is more. Maybe less steroids are good for you. Certainly less uh, endotracheal intubation and probably less oxygen in the delivery room are, are, are good for you. This sort of fits with the with the spectrum. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we're way overdosing our steroids. I think DART is also maybe a little bit high. You could probably go lower with DART if you wanted. If you actually wanted to finish the study. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a good it's a good suggestion, isn't it? But uh, if you put DART historically, we were coming off the Cummings, which was many many times the. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, there's dose. no question. I mean, I think your study is really valuable. It's changed. There's a lot of babies that aren't being massively poisoned and getting the hypertension and the cardiac effects of the 40, 42 day course. So that was that's really valuable. I think that's good. The only thing is, is I think if somebody has the guts to do it, you could do a, a lower dose. Our, our um, focus has changed to the the mix. And, and you could the use, and you could you could use. Uh, uh, beta methadone rather than Dex. It has a little bit longer half life, so you could only, you could probably just do, uh, you know, one dose. Alan, Alan, I just wonder where the uh, Kirsty Waterberg's low dose hydrocortisone in the first few days of life as a sort of physiological replacement uh, coincides with the antenatal steroids. Does that make sense? You've shown us how that it suppresses uh, cortisol in that first week. Is that is that a, a link that they should be explored? Okay, I'll, I'll give away a really good fellow project. So a really good fellow project would be someone, and you've got a lot of good fellows, would be someone who was willing to, to snag cord bloods and to snag discard blood over the first week of life in your babies after they're delivered and measure, measure beta methadone. And I think if you did that and you sent them to Perth, they'd measure them for you. And you could actually determine the clearance of uh, beta methadone in the newborn, which would be really valuable information. You could do the same study with uh, when you're treating them with uh, dexamethasone. That would also be useful information. And uh, you might find that uh, they're massively adrenal suppressed. Um, I mean, they do have some, there are, are some decent studies now saying that low dose steroids actually benefits these babies. And they certainly have adrenal insufficiency. I mean, if you measure their cortisol products coming out of their uh, their, their adrenals, they're, most of them are precursors. They're not mature cortisol. So uh, they're struggling to get cortisol out. And uh, so I think it makes sense to give them a small amount of cortisol. But um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, uh, we're not doing that here. I don't know if you're doing that there. You're too conservative to do, to do it in Melbourne. <laughs> well, we're pretty wild in Sydney. Um, so Peter wants to do a low dose dot trial. Okay, cool, you're on. <laughs> um, and Matt Kemp is online as well, Ellen. Um, Matt, do you wanna unmute yourself? We're going to hassle you for a talk soon anyway, so might as well get used to us. Matt? Shall Matt, you're there? You? He is there. Matt, you're muted. While he's trying to unmute it. Oh, there he is. Hi, everyone. Hey, Matt. Thanks for joining. Hey, so where's your tie, Matt? Uh, well, I wasn't expecting to front up this morning, so I'm a little bit more casual than you are. Actually, I have to say, I've been working with Alan for 12 years now. I think this is the second time I've seen him wearing a tie, so this is this is a clearly a special occasion. Very special. So you have a question, Matt? What did I say that was wrong? <laughs> no, he's the only obstetrician online, is he? Well, he's he's yeah, a sheep I'm... obstetrician. He's not oh, real. Yeah, close, close enough. enough. No, look, I think um, I think you're bang on as always, uh, Alan. I think that um, uh, there's a there's a lot of scope to to shoot lower. I think we need to uh, work out how we can do that um, safely. I think the other the other thing that you make really pretty clear is that the the evolution of this particular area needs to be um, evidence based and data driven. And I think that 
Liggins and Howie got off to a really, really good start you know, in the late 1960s. And then there was a, a little bit of a lull um, for a, a couple of decades. And hopefully we're starting to make up on some of that ground now and getting a really good handle on exactly how much you need for how long and how often uh, to really optimize these, these babies' um, outcomes. I mean, I think the, the bottom line is this dohide stuff is really concerning because we may, we're damaging a lot of babies in terms of neurodevelopment based on the Finnish study, which I think is a remarkable study, 670,000 babies. Um, and we're causing uh, metabolic syndrome in some of these babies, and we're probably stuffing up some of their hearts, and we're stuffing up some of their lung development. So uh, there's a lot of a lot of reason to try to get this right. On that note, we might take a um, question from um, Nadia Badawi. Um, Nadia, are you still online? Um, she's asked um, a question. She's seen a big drop in CP in Australia, cerebral mm -hmm. palsy in Australia, almost certainly attributable to antenatal steroids. It's a tricky balance. What is your comment on this? Well, so, I mean, the Finnish study said that uh, basically their outcome was that in their preemies that got steroids, they had more, they, they were equivalent to other preemies so that they were protected from some of the injuries related to prematurity. But um, they didn't really break it out in terms of uh, uh, CP. So um, I don't know the answer to that. So Nadia's online. May I ask Nadia to have a comment, please? Yeah, I suppose, no, fantastic talk, Alan, thank you. Uh, yeah. Look, I just, I suppose I worry that some people, you know how extreme we are in neonatal practice and someone will go, oh no, I'm never giving antenatal steroids again. And I'm sure that's not, I just want to make sure we don't use that message and that people say, no, I won't use it because it has halved the rates of intracranial hemorrhage we're never going to be able to do an RCT of steroids versus no steroids in high income countries. So I suppose I just don't want us to abandon antenatal steroids. No, no, absolutely. Completely. I mean, I, I think the, I mean, I truly believe that much lower doses are probably equally as effective. But we, somebody has to do a clinical trial in Australia or someplace to prove that before it becomes standard of care. I mean, I think we all have to realize. I, mean, I think we all have to realize that, that Matt uh, alluded to, and that nobody ever tested the dosing that's presently used. That was just sort of made up uh, out of whole cloth. And so, yeah. and it's actually a remarkably high dose by any other use of steroids yes. in normal clinical medicine. So it makes no sense. So when, so when we do the trial, uh, then I think we really need to follow up these children to at least five years and see what they really look like. Well, you actually have to follow them out to 60 years to find out how their hearts and lungs are. Uh, <laughs> so so the, problem with, the problem with this, uh, this low F, uh, FEV1 that these kids have is preterms. All preterms have low FEV1s relative to term infants is that they're tracking on a way that by the time they're 30 years old, they have the, the findings of COPD. So they're gonna not live very long if they keep tracking down as they age. So that's, I think the lung problem is actually a substantial problem. And, and so our preemies, when they leave, even though they're technically normal, even by your brain tests, they have other problems. Okay. Maybe we might take a couple of questions, more questions, and then um, uh, close it. We're at two o'clock already. Um, so from Dr. Pajaba from Bangalore, he says in India, the frequent instances where ladies come in with imminent preterm delivery, can get a standard dose of steroids, then two doses more. Um, we should be discouraging this, right? Yes. Ranjan, you can unmute yourself. This is, um, are you still there? The Dr. Ranjan Pajaba. He has run away, is he? I'm so, there. Oh, he is there, yes. Yeah, okay. I am there. So my, rec my suggestion is, two, is twofold. First of all, I think if you're using, 
Nick, what are you using? Are you using Dex or are you using Celeste? I know you're using Dex because there's no yes. Celeste in India. Yes, in government hospitals, Dex, and many of us use uh, beta methasone also. Okay, so uh, beta methasone is not really uniformly available in India. And it's more expensive. That's right. More stable. That's right, and the compound is different. Yeah. Yeah. So with Dex, you have much more rapid clearance. And so you don't have these long persistent blood levels like you do with the Celestone. So if you're using DEX, maybe repeated treatments make sense. I don't know. I'm, I'm concerned about the uh, additive effects of too, many, too much steroids. What I would suggest oh. to you is just wait because there's this French study of giving only one dose of Celestone. And, and that's a big randomized study. And if that shows equivalence, then the way to go is one dose of Celestone and not repeated doses. Okay, um, apologies if I don't have time to ask all your questions, but we may leave the last question to um, William Tanomordi. Thank you, thank you. Uh, William, can, can you um, read out your question because it's a long one. Is he still there? Um, Alan, uh, one of the things that struck me the most in the last 10 years is the massive cluster randomized control trial by Fernando Alfabe for um, WHO in six lower and middle income countries showing the adverse net effects of antenatal steroids in low and middle income countries, 98,000 women in six low and middle income countries. And presumably the effects you described today could go a long way towards explaining those paradoxical adverse effects. So, uh, howdy, how are you? I can see you, you probably can't see me. At any rate, um, I have two thoughts on that. One is, as I mentioned, there's a trial that's completed by WHO in um, good hospitals in India and Africa that is in press. So we sort of have to wait for that one to see what that one. So they cannot make the claim that that study shows that uh, that these drugs are safe in low, uh, low care environments. So the problem is, is how do you do a good study in low care environments? There's been massive criticism of the Alfabi study. It was a tough study to do, and I'm not sure how you can do it much better in those environments. So uh, I think, uh, if anybody wants to really know if steroids are safe in those entire environments, then you have to go back and do a study. And I'd suggest if you're going to do it, you ought to do it with low dose steroids. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, Gates and uh, the WHO are chewing on designing such a trial right now. So maybe it'll actually happen. And the other thing to say is that I think the design of studies is going to be revolutionized by the impact of the UK recovery trial, which is a multi-arm study with five arms in it. And we're thinking about really big studies and international collaboration. We need to take on board the idea of moving away from a simple two-arm study towards the kind of adaptive platform design that they used in that study. Um, he's drinking Shiraz. Anything we can do to decrease the size of studies and their cost would be great. I think everybody ought to look at that paper from Finland because again, 690,000 pregnancies followed for, their average follow-up is about six or eight years for neurodevelopmental outcomes. It's pretty damn remarkable. And I think it just blows away all the other epidemiology that's been done. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, I do apologize for not having the time to go through all the other questions, Ellen. Um, you can uh, email Ellen directly if that's okay with questions. Um, just a last comment from Dr. Kishore Kumar. He will take you shopping next time you're in Bangalore. So- um, What, a better looking shirt or a better looking- 5 a.m. he said, 5 a.m. So you're up to it, right? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. That was it fun. It's fantastic, Ellen. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great time in hey, Florida. Man. Yeah. Hey, Richard. Alan. Say hi. <laughs> see you, Steve. Good to see you. Great job. Hey. <laughs> thank you. We'll post a recording of all these uh, lovely people. Um, and thank you. Thank you once again. All the best. From our Thailand, Ellen. Good luck. Hey, all the best for you.
Say hi, Supa. All the best for you. I'd love to get back to Bangkok again. Yeah, you are always invited. <laughs> so uh, we'll work something out, Ellen. Good All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. Bye.